In this video, we're going to look at finding the equation of a tangent line at a point. How we're going to do that is we're going to first look at the problem that we're given. We're told, using the definition of a derivative, which we're given here, we want to find the slope of the line tangent to f of x equals 1 over root x at x equals 64. So we have our point in question, we have our function, now we need to use the definition of the derivative that we have to find the equation of the tangent line at that point. The first thing we're going to need to do is exactly what it says here. We're going to need to find the slope of the line tangent to our function at our point, which we will do that by using the definition of the derivative, using the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. By using this limit here, we're going to end up finding the derivative of f of x if we plug in 64 for our x value. But first what we're going to do is just to say that we've covered all of our bases, we're first going to cover discrepancies that we could come up with for this function. Now when I say discrepancies, what I mean is some discontinuities we could come across, holes, asymptote, that stuff we've been talking about in previous sections. So what we're going to look at first is let's look at our function and see if it's continuous everywhere. By the nature of a rational function, we know that it's not usually continuous everywhere. So let's go ahead and check and see if we have any holes, any asymptotes, discontinuities, stuff like that that we need to keep in mind as we're looking at this problem. So first we're going to check for vertical asymptotes. We have a VA. And we know that those happen when the denominator, so we have the denominator, equals zero. So let's solve for x here and see what makes our denominator zero. So we square both sides, cancel out that, so we get that x equals 0. So there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Will that pose a problem for us in this question? Not really, because the x that we're evaluating our function at, or our derivative, mind you, is 64. That doesn't equal 0, so we're good. Don't have to worry about that one too much. What about a horizontal asymptote? We know that in a case like this, where the power of our denominator is greater than the power of our numerator, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. This will only really become a factor if our function ever evaluates to be 0. And in this case, we see that our f of x is 1 over root x. So it's always going to be a fractional answer that we get if we evaluated any x inside of our domain. And namely, the domain of our function here is going to be positive real x's because we can't take the square root of a negative number in the real numbers, we can in the complex numbers, but we are not concerned with the complex numbers in this question. What we're dealing with is the real numbers. So what we're also going to be dealing with is as we take the square root of, say, 64 here, we know that the square root of that returns a positive or a negative 8, but what we're going to deal with in the case of graphing, and for the most part, is we're only going to deal with the principal roots. The principal root is the positive answer that we get. It's the positive root. The reason why we focus so harshly on those for these cases of graphing, it also comes into play with a lot of the uh, properties that allow us to use square roots in the way that we do. Say the product property for square roots, the quotient property for square roots, all those different kinds of things. When we use those, we're only taking into account the positive answer that we receive after taking the square root. So for the sake of graphing, what we're also going to do is just focus on the principal square root. So what that means is, for any positive x in our domain that we take the square root of, we're always going to get a number larger than 0. We'll approach arbitrarily close to 0, because as we've evaluated with something similar like this, as x grows arbitrarily large, f of x grows arbitrarily close to 0, so the limit is 0, but the value of our function will never become 0. So we know that this is not going to pose a problem for us either. So we're OK. Any other discrepancies that we have? Don't really think so. So we're all good with our discrepancies. They shouldn't play a huge part in this problem. So let's go ahead and move on and actually do the evaluating of our derivative. So when we talk about evaluating the derivative, what that means is we're going to use this definition that we're given here. But what we're going to do is we're going to plug in 64 for x so that we're only dealing with one variable here, namely the variable that is approaching 0, which is why we're taking the limit. So what we're going to do in this next step 
is we're going to have, instead of f prime of x, f prime of 64. We're evaluating the derivative at x equals 64 because we want to find the slope of the line tangent to f of x at x equals 64. So what we have now is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 64 plus h minus f of 64 over h. So now let's use our f of x that we have from our question, plugging in 64 plus h and 64 inside of this, and let's rewrite what we have going on here. So we sub the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 64 plus h. So now what we have is 1 over the square root of 64 plus h. And then we have minus f of 64. Let's go over here and evaluate what f of 64 is right now. So f of 64 is 1 over the square root of 64. So that evaluates to give us... 1 over 8. Okay, so we have minus 1 over 8, and this is over h. Now that we've made our substitutions and we have a limit problem, let's use the first step in any limit question that we're given. Let's pass the limit. Let's see what happens when we plug in 0 for h. So we get 1 over square root of 64 plus 0, which is going to be 1 over square root of 64. We found that to be 1 over 8. So in the numerator, we have 1 over 8 minus 1 over 8, which is 0. We get 0 over 0, and that is indeterminate. So in order to evaluate this limit further, we're going to need to do some manipulation about it and see if we can make this a little bit more apparent as to what our limit is. So the first thing I want to do is I want to see, can I combine these two fractions in the numerator and make it just one fraction up here? And I can, it's just going to be a matter of subtracting these fractions. Well, what do you need in order to subtract fractions but a common denominator? In this case, our LCD is going to be what we get when we multiply 8 times root 64 plus h. We're just going to multiply the two denominators together. So we get 8 times root 64 plus h. So in the second fraction's case, we're missing a root 64 plus h from the denominator. So let's go ahead and multiply in to the numerator and denominator of the second fraction, a root 64 plus h. And in the first fraction, similarly, we're missing an 8. So let's multiply in a numerator and the denominator, let's multiply in an 8. So what we're going to get now is still the limit as h approaches 0, but our fractions in the numerator are going to look a little different. So we're going to have 8 over 8 square root 64 plus h minus root 64 plus h over 8 times root 64 plus h. Now that we have the same denominator in these two fractions, we can subtract them. So what we're going to do next is we're going to have the limit as h approaches 0 of 8 minus root 64 plus h over 8 times root 64 plus h. And this fraction is still over the fraction h, which we understand to be a fraction of h over 1. The reason why I make that apparent again is because we're going to multiply by the reciprocal to make this just one fraction up here. So we're going to do keep, flip, and multiply. So we have 1 over h, 1 over h. The denominator cancels out to 1, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Let's worry about this multiplication now. So we have the limit as h approaches 0, 8 minus root 64 plus h over 8h root 64 plus h. Okay, so when I arrive here, I still see that I have this square root inside of the numerator of my fraction. And doing a quick little pass to the limit test, I know that I'm still gonna get a zero over zero if I keep evaluating the limit here. So what we're gonna do now is to take care of this numerator, we use that trick that we know as multiplying by the conjugate. So we're gonna multiply our function that we have by eight plus root 64 plus h. Okay, that's supposed to be a plus, there we go. So now, in this step, let's carry out that multiplication. So we still have the limit as h approaches 0. We're going to multiply the first here, because we're multiplying two binomials, so we're going to do FOIL. So we have 8 times 8, which is 64. But then when we do the next two multiplications, the outer and the inner, we're going to get 8 root 64 plus h and minus 8 root 64 plus h. So they're just going to go away. So we can ignore those terms. But when we do the last, we're going to get a negative times a positive, so we get a negative. And then we, when we multiply the same square root by itself, effectively what's going to happen there is the square root's going to get squared, so the square root goes away. So what we get is that expression inside of the radical 
and that's just left by itself. So that's when we multiply by the conjugate in the numerator. The denominator gets a little bit more hectic. What we're going to end up doing is this right here, this first denominator, is technically one term. It's a multiplication of many things, but it's technically one term. So what we're going to do is we're going to distribute 8h times root 64 plus h to 8 and root 64 plus h in this step. So we get 8h times 8, so that gives us 64h, and this is also having tagged onto it 64 plus h. So this is what happens when we distribute this into the first bit, and then we're going to add 8h times root 64 plus h, root 64 plus h, again, it's, we're multiplying the same root times itself, so the square root goes away, and what we're left with is the expression underneath the square root, or the radicand. Quick little vocab refresher there. So this is what we're left with now. Let's see what happens in the numerator when we take care of one more step that I can see that we can do. So we still have the limit as h approaches zero. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna distribute this negative into the parentheses. So we get 64 minus 64 minus h in the numerator. 64 minus 64 evaluates as zero, so that goes away. All we're left with is negative h. Good, we're starting to dwindle away some terms here. So our denominator, we're still gonna have a bit of a mess here. We have 64h times 64, or times the square root of 64 plus h, plus 8h times 64, well, plus h. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna distribute 8h into this parentheses. So we have 8h times 64, and that will give us 512h. 8h times h, 8h squared. So this is what we're dealing with so far. All the terms in this denominator that we're dealing with, they all have an h in common. So let's come over here, factor out that h out of the denominator, and see what happens from there. So we're still left with negative h on the top, but now we have h times 64 root 64 plus h plus 512 plus 8h. Well, now we have h times this underneath a negative h. Since these are factors of division, we can divide them out. So we can cancel out those h's. So now what we're left with is the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 1 over everything that we had in that parentheses. 64 plus h. Extend that a little bit. Plus 512 plus 8h. Now that we have this, let's see what happens when we pass to the limit here and plug in 0 for h. So what we're going to get, negative 1 over 64 times 64 plus 0 is just 64. So we have 64 times the square root of 64 plus 512 plus 8 times 0. 8 times 0 goes away to be 0. So what we have now is negative 1 over 64 times root 64, root 64 becomes 8. So now we have 64 times 8, which we saw earlier to be 512. So we have 512 plus 512. Adding those two numbers in the denominator, we find that our limit is negative 1 over 1024. So we did all this limit evaluation, but let's not lose sight of what we did here. We evaluated the derivative of our original function at x equals 64. So what this gives us is the instantaneous rate of change or the slope of our line tangent to f of x equals one over root x at x equals 64. So we've taken care of part one. So now that we're done with part one and we found the slope of the line tangent to f of x at x equals 64, let's look at what part two has to offer. Part two asks us, to find the equation of the line tangent to the curve at x equals 64. So let's take a quick second and talk through something real quick. When we're talking about finding the equation of a line tangent, so we need to figure out tangent line, the equation for it. Tangent line implies that, as we all know, the tangent line is going to be a linear function. And what to widely known forms of linear functions do we know and remember from our previous math classes? I can think of two. We have slope-intercept, 
and point slope form. In both cases, we know what the slope is. The slope is negative 1 over 1024. We found that. That's our derivative at x equals 64. So we have the slope. So in either case, whichever one we choose, we're good on the slope part of it. But I'm leaning towards using point slope form. The reason for that is if we look back at the work we did up here, we've already found a point to use up here. Can you spot it? It's right here. f of 64 is 1 over 8. So we have a point to use. Namely, what our point is, let's go ahead and write it here. So our x is 64, and our f of x is 1 over 8. So we have a point, we have slope, let's go ahead and use point slope form. But now we kind of ask ourselves, well, what does point slope form look like? It's this one. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, where x1 and y1 are our point, and m is our slope. So let's use this form down here, plug in what we know, and let's rearrange it to get into slope-intercept form, because the question asks us to put our answer back into slope-intercept form. So what we have is y minus 1 8 equals negative 1 over 1024 times x minus 64. Okay, so let's distribute our slope into this parentheses. So we get y minus 1 over 8 equals negative 1 over 1024 x plus 64 over 1024. Okay, so what this fraction becomes, the 64 over 1024, it actually simplifies and reduces down quite nicely. So what we're going to get is we're going to rewrite everything else that we have, the stuff that we know that we can't reduce right now. But this 64 over 1024 becomes 1 over 16. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to get y by itself to get it finally into slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b. In order to do that, we need to isolate y. So to do that, we're going to add 1 8 and then we're going to add 1 8 over here. So this goes away. So what we have left is y equals negative 1 over 1024x plus we have 1 16th plus an eighth. We don't have common denominators yet, but with a quick little change here by multiplying the second fraction by 2 in the numerator and the denominator, we will now get a fraction of 2 over 16. So we have 1 16th plus 2 16ths, which gives us 3 over 16. And this is the equation of our line tangent to our curve at x equals 64.